In this episode, we discuss grief and loss with an in-depth conversation surrounding pet loss. We understand the gravity of this discussion and the impact of this topic. If you are not in a place to listen, we understand and we hope you find healing. We encourage everyone, listener or not, to investigate the resources available in our show notes. Welcome to Beers and Biscuits. I'm Nicole. And I'm Karen. And this is a dog cast for the rest of us. So, Karen... How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this discussion because I think it's one that needs to be shared. How are you doing, Nicole? I'm okay. Had a little bit of a, a rough go of today. As you know, I talked to you earlier. I thought we were going to have a little bit different of a discussion today. We had an emergency with one of our client dogs. And that was pretty scary for a little bit. I I think it really hits home with this topic of pet loss and grief. Even though the dog is fine, it almost wasn't the case. And I very much experienced that dread and worry today that I had felt, you know, I felt so many times before. Um, but it was very scary a lot of emotions came up today. So I think this is a very good day to have this conversation. It, it's a way to hopefully channel some of the residual effects of what you experience today. And I also think it speaks very highly about who you are as a, as a human, that you had such strong and valid feelings for a dog that isn't even your own. I think that's the case with a lot of people in this profession that, you know, we get very attached to the dogs and the cats and the rabbits and everything else that's in our care. And we can't help but internalize those losses. And sometimes they're equal to the, our own losses um, especially for clients that, you know, we've had for a really long time or, you know, clients that maybe we spend more time with. Dogs that I've had over the years that weren't just walking clients, but then had also become clients that I've taken into my home for like vacation boarding, things like that. We get very attached to them. And so the grief that we can feel with that is almost equal sometimes. Definitely. And I, I think we also kind of have an unusual side of it too, because coming at it from the behavior side of things, sometimes we're having really difficult conversations with our clients about the potential for behavioral euthanasia. And I can remember my first dog I ever recommended for that. It really sticks with you. So it's not a, an easy thing to experience. Yes, it's not easy. And I think it lends to also the different types of grief that we can have. We're on both sides of that fence, right? We're pet guardians, but we're also pet care providers, even, you know, pet dog trainers, behavior professionals, even veterinarians um, and dog walkers. We're on both sides of, of that coin. And so... I think it really lends to how can we better understand the grief that we might be feeling when we do take on both of those roles? Well, and I think when we were getting ready for this podcast and we were both searching our souls um, to decide what we wanted to talk about and what we were okay to talk about. One of the things that you brought up is this idea of cumulative grief. And, and I think that's something we need to talk about. 
I feel like I'm a very emotionally quiet person for the most part. I mean, obviously, you know, there are some things that uh, will get a little emotion about, emotional about and we'll share that. But for the most part, I feel like I'm a very introspective emotional person. And so I carry a lot inside that I don't necessarily outwardly share with people. And so for me, when I think about grief, I don't necessarily always think about the way life experiences can also be grieved and how that can stack on each other. So for me specifically, having gone through the loss of my home, having had to move 3,000 plus miles across the country because I lost my home, um, having to rehome some of my dogs, having to rehome my horses, losing friends, losing my job. Those were all losses that we don't necessarily tie to grief. And so not having really processed those things and not really allowing myself to fully understand that those things can be grieved and that having those emotions about those things is just as natural as having grief emotions about a loss of a person. Having experienced all of that and having that kind of weighing down this backpack of of my life, on top of that, 2021 lost Zed. We talked very briefly about him, about being my heart dog, being the dog without whom I would not be myself. In our 16 and a half years together, I can count on one hand how many days that I was without him. In, in preparation for this, I was trying to think about that. And I actually, in that amount of time, only went away twice without him. Two times in 16 years was I without him. Once was for my sister's wedding, and the other was for a family road trip that we took. So losing him was incredibly hard. I felt such an immense amount of weight. I don't want to say it was, you know, like a like emotionally like a depression, but it was more of just heavy. I just felt heavy. Everything seemed to take more effort, take longer. There wasn't that sense of things that I could find happiness in because a, a lot of those things were tied to enjoying these things with Zed and Charlie. When I think about how to explain that, I do think about it like a backpack, like I'm wearing this backpack that I'm just piling more and more bricks into. And eventually I, I can't pick it up anymore. Like I can't, I can't pick it up off the ground to get it on my back anymore. And so just when I think that I'm allowing myself to feel the grief about Zed, I then get gut punched with losing Charlie which was completely unexpected, traumatic. I mean, they both were traumatic, but with Zed, I, I, I feel like I was able to anticipate that a little bit more. But with Charlie, it really was just, I just had this feeling. We went on a little trip. We had a nice weekend. I just had a feeling like something was not right. Went to the vet and I think it was four days between when we went to the vet and they said something was not right and when I was bringing him in to, to be put to sleep. So at that point, that backpack was just unbearable. It was just too full. So that accumulation, all those little bricks of grief just stacked too much. And so I think it's really important when we talk about grief that we understand that even if we feel like we've processed it or we feel like we've gotten through it or we feel like we're in a better place, that there are still sometimes remnants of those bricks in our backpack. We might not notice them until we add another brick to it. And so I think it's really important to let ourselves feel and to acknowledge the way that we feel and that the way that we feel is normal. I think at least in my opinion, what we're trying to accomplish with this episode is, in my mind, sharing with people that pet loss and the grief that comes with it is a very real thing. 
and you don't have to carry the backpack by yourself. It may be incredibly difficult to let a brick or two go. There are people out there who understand, who want to listen, and they just care. We There are people out there that care. Thank you. It does. It means a lot. It means a lot. And I've written, you know, I've been very candid about my feelings on some of my posts. I feel like that in a, in a little bit of a way has been me handing some of the pieces of those bricks to other people. You know, I feel like that lets people in a little bit, but it's still really hard for me to let a lot of that be shown to people, I guess. It's hard. It's hard. And there's a lot of other emotions too that go along with that, right? So it's not just the grief of it. It's also the guilt of it. It's also the questioning of yourself. Did I do everything that I could, especially when it comes to our pets, right? There's always this thought that maybe we could do or could have done or should have done more. I just try to not let those thoughts take control. Like I, I feel like it's okay to, to have those thoughts sometimes because I feel like those, those thoughts are a normal part of the process, but I don't want them to take hold and I don't want them to be all encompassing. But I do think that it is part of the process too, to understand that there are all of these other emotions that go along with the grief process. Well, and I think, like you said, like it is this guilt and it's these other losses as well of not just this creature you've shared your life with. It's the loss of the routine that you've created, the wake up calls at 6 a.m. to go out and go potty. All of that is part of the loss. So you're you're also grieving a life that you have created, not just the animal. I am very fortunate to not experience pet grief. I have experienced human loss, but for me, CJ's 10 now. Mm. I, I know. <laughs> um, it is every winter now, it's kind of this idea for me of, is this the last time he sees snow? I am already in a place where I am anticipating that grief. Well, unprepared, but I don't think anybody can ever be prepared for that kind of loss. But I think it also kind of steals some of the beautiful moments because instead of just enjoying that snowstorm, it's since the last year we go out and take our first snow of the year selfie. So there's also, there's not just cumulative grief, there's anticipatory grief as well. For as helpful as that potentially can be, in the overall grieving process, it does have that potential to overshadow the memories that you could be making or are making. You know, I, I completely understand that. The, the last summer vacation that we took with the dogs with Zed and Charlie, I remember saying, this is our last summer. This is going to be our last summer at this place. In the back of my mind, I'm sure that did creep in and it did steal away from some of those memories that we could be making, right? Or at least my ability to be present in those memories. I mean, I still remember them, but was I as present as I could have been if I wasn't thinking this was going to be our last summer at this place? And so the idea of anticipatory grief, I think, is also very valid with pet loss. A lot of times we do have a lot of illnesses with our pets that are more chronic, that are more long-term. And so I think we do kind of get stuck in this anticipatory grief trap. And it does keep us from being truly present, I think, in the moments for them at the end. And I think too, it kind of also feeds into another idea surrounding pet loss is there have been times with the anticipatory grief, I've tried to have conversations with people about what that's going to look like, what I may need from them afterwards and things like that. Sometimes with some people, you get met with this idea of, oh, don't even think about that. It's so far off. Or, oh, it's, it's just a dog. You'll be fine. Or he's going to live forever. And well, all those things. 
I feel are good natured when I'm trying to speak about help I may need in the future. Those are not helpful comments. And I think that that really kind of hits a couple of different aspects of pet loss grief. First, it's well, what can be called disenfranchised grief, right? Because society as a whole or as a larger picture, we don't really consider pet loss grief to be on the same level or on par with the other types of grief, right? So me trying to have a conversation with somebody about how painful it is to have lost my dog and how that is internalized in a different way than, say, losing a grandparent. There's this disenfranchisement, if that's the right word, of the grief that we're feeling around our pets because they're not given this equal footing. The grief that we're feeling, or in your case, anticipating, isn't equal when not only should it be equal, but we should be having even more conversations about it. I completely agree because my case is a little different than most dog owners, but since CJ came home, I have worked out of the house. So I have, just like you were saying, where you only went away twice, I have spent 24-7 with this dog, except for maybe a week or two here or there. Yes, there have been people in my life that I have lost and loved dearly and grieve to this day, but I didn't spend 24 hours with them. They weren't there when I woke up or went to bed or took a shower or <laughs> just tried to get the mail. I think it's it's time that society starts to realize the effect that pets have on their guardians because they can become our whole life. Absolutely. This is a really good spot, I would like to read a little excerpt from Michelle Rindell. What I want you to know about companion animal grief. And it talks very much about disenfranchised grief as well. But there's a couple sentences here that I think just really hit home. And Michelle writes, companion animal grief deserves empathy, compassion and validation from society, from your boss, from friends and family and from the griever themselves. Your heartbreak and anguish over the loss of your pet is valid. To have your life shattered over this loss is valid. It is not less than in any way. Living without my constant companion is agonizing. So when I hear people or when I see people react to someone in that way, that their grief is not valid, or it's not as valid, or you shouldn't be that sad, or you should be over it by now. If we could just lead with a little bit more empathy for whatever stage of grief you are in, or wh whichever one somebody in your life is experiencing, try to lead with a little bit more empathy. And remember, we all grieve differently, and pets are, are incredibly valid, and we all deserve to grieve how we see fit. There are definitely things that weren't helpful for me, but some of the things that were helpful, when people either asked me about Zed and Charlie, like what our favorite thing was or what our, what my favorite memory was versus just saying they were sorry for my loss, because it helps me to then shift my thinking as well to those memories and to those good times versus, you know, if somebody just says, I'm sorry for your loss, then right. I, I did have a loss and then I kind of get stuck in that cycle of feelings again. So it's been helpful for me for either people to ask me about good memories or even people sharing their good memories of my dog. That's been really helpful to me in the grieving process. I think too, when somebody says, I'm sorry for your loss, it's almost kind of also like a conversation ender. Like, because then it's almost on the person receiving the condolences to try to keep that conversation going and prompt them to ask those questions. And, and when we were talking about this and you shared that, it was so much better for somebody to ask, like, what's your favorite memory? I was like, that makes so much sense. And it is also such a beautiful way to honor the experience that you shared. Whether I knew the dog or not, it's going to be my go-to now talked about it a little bit in the other half where, you know, we talk a little bit more about the healing process. 
disclaimer, we actually did record these backwards, but I do feel like having had to write a lot of condolence cards for our clients and friends and family that have lost their pets, you're right. It, it's a it's an ender. It's almost like period, end of story, full stop. I'm sorry for your loss, period. That's it. So I always try when I write those cards for people, I always try to think about that like and turn it around into something you know, that's going to be a little bit hopefully more meaningful to those people when they read it versus I'm, I'm just sorry for your loss. Sad that I'm not going to be able to see your dog every day or I'm going to miss, you know, their silly little antics or barking in my ear as we're driving down the street, you know, so giving more meaning to what we're saying to somebody about that loss versus I'm just sorry for it. I'm so honored to to hear your stories. And I think that's the way we can all help other pet guardians out as we move forward. Just be open to talking about them because pet loss and really any kind of loss isn't something to do behind closed doors. I mean, yes, of course, if that's who you are and that's how you want to grieve, yes. But I, I think it's also important to remember you don't have to do it alone. I mean, I still feel very, very much in sitting in the grief, especially about Charlie. Like, I feel like, again, because I had that almost anticipatory grief for that pre-grieving with Zed, that I did get to process a lot more of those emotions over a longer period of time. And I did get to deal with those in a in a different way. With Charlie, it was just very different. Very, like I said, very sudden, very unanticipated. And so I feel like that alone ha has made it even harder. I already had those bricks in the bag and then threw some more bricks in the bag. And then it was like, well, these bricks aren't big enough bricks. Let's like double the size of these bricks and then throw them in. So it's still very hard for me to think about and, and talk about Charlie in general. Completely. When I first started having these feelings about CJ... And I make everything into a joke when I don't know how to process it. So I jokingly call it his impending doom, which is terrible. I know. I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to make light of this. That's just how I process. But I thought I was like this person who was losing their mind, this crazy person, because I was like, I'm the only one. But then I don't remember how it came about, but I saw it on, it had to have been social media. Somebody was writing about it and I was like, gosh, I'm not the only one. Like you said, it's so important to have these conversations because then you kind of understand it a little bit better and you can deal with it maybe a little bit better. You realize it is valid. For me, that's been one of the lessons that I've really had to learn. You know, I even did specifically go to a grief counselor to deal with this cumulative grief that I was feeling that just happened to overflow with Charlie's passing. And so that has been very helpful, like being able to actually talk to someone that specializes in understanding grief and loss and the processes that, you know, we experience with that. One of the things that she, had said to me, because I, I said, I feel so silly feeling this bad. I feel like that, you know, kind of lends back to that disenfranchisement where we're almost conditioned to not feel about it when we should be helping people to feel about it. She just said to me, how you feel is valid, where you're at in your grief process is normal, how you feel is normal, and how you feel is valid. And it took a it took a little bit to kind of work through that. We need to have more conversations about it, about how real it can be for people, and not just invalidate people's feelings. The conversation has to start somewhere. And maybe this is the conversation that helps somebody reach out to that grief counselor or look at the resources that we talk about in the next part of the podcast because we don't have the answers. We are just talking about our experiences to hopefully open that door for somebody who may need it. 
And I think understanding for me, you know, understanding that there were going to be a lot of other emotions involved and that those were okay and that they were all tied to that that grief that I was feeling and I hadn't been addressing. Really, the, the conversation that sparked me going to the grief counselor was me talking to my therapist about how I felt like I was getting very short with people, short with myself. And in particular, that I felt like I was having a short fuse and getting short with Peter. And that I almost felt this little bit of resentment towards him because he wasn't Charlie and he wasn't said. And he's never going to be them, obviously. But the grief that I was feeling kind of took over those other emotions that I was having. And so what I might have normally been able to deal with, I wasn't, and I wasn't processing it. And I was getting very short about it. And so I was talking to my regular therapist about how I felt like I was getting very short and I was very emotionally punchy about things. When I started talking to her about Peter her knowing me and how much I loved my dogs and how much I, you know, also loved him, she was able to recognize that immediately and was like, no, we need to get some more specialized therapy for you. She was able to recognize that those other emotions that I were feeling were also tied to that, to that grief, which I would not have been able to put that together myself. Honestly, I, I don't think I would have ever made that connection that those two things were intertwined. And so I'm very thankful she was able to do that. I do have a question for you though. I forgot with all of our talking, I forgot to ask you the question that I had for you. If you're okay talking about it, You had mentioned something, and I don't even know if you were aware of it, but you had mentioned that bringing Rosie home and having Rosie enter your house and all of the things that that zhuzhes up emotionally, that you were grieving the life and the situation that you had prior to her coming home. Are you okay talking about that? Yeah, absolutely. I I do remember talking about this. My husband is a Marine and we got CJ a year after we got married. And as a Marine, he would deploy. And CJ is, was, and has always been the one constant of my, pretty much my entire adult life. And we created, in my opinion, a beautiful life together. And then to, in some ways, not really have much say over this new dog coming into the home because it's a, Rosie is a working dog for my husband. It was a struggle because I liked my life. I liked my life with CJ and how easy it was. And I didn't have to worry about baby gates. I didn't have to worry about accidents or things like that. And I knew that he was always going to curl up on the sofa next to me and watch New Girl on Endless Repeat. So when Rosie came into our life, it was a big change after 10 years of having only one dog. And now there's baby gates everywhere and there's shuffling dogs in and out and making sure that they don't accidentally get to each other while they're going through this adjustment period. It was, and still is at times, it's a big change and it's a big adjustment and I have a lot of big feelings around it still. And I think even just something... I mean, we say something as simple as a change in routine. Like I know that we've talked about having to change up like your mornings because she doesn't have the same routine that you and CJ, you know, that you've established and that having to change those things can kind of give you a little sense, a little bit of grieving the routine and the comfort and the safety those big feelings, they can be grief. Definitely. And I also, I just have to take a moment to thank you because the amount of voice notes you listen to me complain about Rosie getting up at 4 a.m. I do think the other side too is this idea of, like you said, the loss of the routine and the loss of the ease. But then because I am a person that tends to go to the dark side a lot, 
there's this level of anticipatory grief of losing CJ and then kind of like you went through in a way anticipatory resentment towards Rosie of this is going to sound terrible but why are you here and he's not it's so valid and it's it's not good feeling to feel that and then so we then get into our feelings about feeling guilty about feeling that we get into these feeling cycles like completely understand like why you know I, I I think I've said it a couple of times maybe I've said it to you I know I've definitely said it to my sister where had I not had Peter when Charlie passed I wouldn't have Peter now I said that then I I don't feel that way now I absolutely love and adore him and I've but I'm starting to be able to shed a little bit of that grief and a little bit of that resentment that I can start to see him for him and I can start to embrace him and I can start to love him and open up to him the way I had for Zed and Charlie. But I completely understand that feeling because I I felt that as well. And I think that's kind of twofold thing that I want to kind of bring back to what we were talking about a little bit is this idea of things people say and the amount of people who know how much CJ means to me, who have said, oh, I'm so glad you got another dog before he goes, because that's going to help you. That isn't helpful. And then the other side of it is, it's so important to remember that these other dogs aren't the ones that aren't with us anymore. And that's, that's very hard. It's hard when, again, when you have all of these other emotions that are also kind of compounding and playing into that. Because I think sometimes even before dogs pass, people experience that. Because I know even talking to Neil since Rosie has come home, there have been moments where he's been like, I just wish she was more like CJ. And there I am saying to him, well, that's not fair to her. You can't do that. It's hard. I mean, that really the only thing that we can do is just see the dog in front of us, love the dog in front of us, embrace the dog in front of us for all of their individual traits and personality quirk. And as best we can, you know, to recognize that if we are having those feelings that we should talk about them. I think it's such a big topic that we could talk for another three hours about it because it's the best way to honor the dogs and pets that have been in our life. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad that we did it. It was hard. I, I was a little equal parts excited and trepidatious at the same time about this topic and really wanting to do the topic justice you know, hopefully we can foster more conversations about it in the future. And so, yeah, so I'm very glad that we did this. And I have a feeling that we'll probably do more episodes on this topic. The conversation has to start somewhere. And for me, I think the the next part of this podcast is, is really something special for people to listen to. Because, well, in this one, we've been talking a little bit about the different kinds of grief. In the next one, we start talking about how to process and heal that grief. And maybe this is the conversation that helps somebody reach out to that grief counselor or look at the resources that we talk about in the next part of this podcast, because we don't have the answers. We are just talking about our experiences to hopefully open that door for somebody who may need it.